Good morning. Welcome to our worship. Thank you for choosing to participate and enhancing our worship to God by being here or online to listen, to read, to sing, to pray. We really do appreciate that. I also want to thank you one more time for the piano repair donations. As of last Sunday's offering, we have raised $1,941 of the estimated $2,000 repair. So, Thank you for your generosity. We appreciate that a lot as well. Next Sunday is Praise Band Sunday, so you'll want to come and support them as they lead you in the singing next week. Today we want to thank Jim Cleveland in the tech booth, Pat Schley and others who helped prepare the coffee hour for, and treats for after the morning worship at the other end of the building in Armstrong Hall. Our ushers are Jeff Gordonier and... Mary Jo Malott. Today's lay reader is Ben Williams. Our musicians are Kathy Novak and Donna Almond and Randy Bell. And this week, and hopefully most weeks to come, Mary Jo Bell will be leading us in much of the congregation singing, all the music prior to the sermon. We've also moved the creed up a bit in the order of service. And so, will you now join Ben in the Apostles' Creed while I offer the prompting questions? Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was succeeded by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He was descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Today's money verse comes from Exodus 35. Moses said to the whole congregation of the people, Here is what the Lord has ordered. Take up a collection for the Lord from among yourselves. Anyone whose heart makes him willing, whoever is of generous heart, is to bring the Lord's contribution, the offering for the Lord. Remember that if you have a prayer request to give your prayer slip directly to the usher as they now collect the offering.
Heavenly Father, you are Lord of our lives. Your son Jesus, by washing the disciples' feet, gave us the example of how to love one another. May our offerings of our resources, our time, our energy, our worship, our very selves serve to wash away fear and distrust, that as we gather we may hear and heed your call, grow our faith, be bathed in your love, finding peace and inspiration for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If it's comfortable for you to do so, please remain standing for the call to worship and the first hymn. Come, receive a clear vision of this path and strength for, for the journey. Be refreshed in the love of Christ and mutual care for each other as we gather in this place or online to worship. Today we focus on gaining confidence in God's call and mission on our lives. So let's begin by singing Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory to the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I cannot fail Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior You may be seated. Our confidence in his promises is strengthened when we are assured of our secure relationship within the love of Jesus. Let us sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story.
Once upon a time, there was a little disabled six-year-old boy, the son of a poor cleaning woman, and they lived in a tiny room several stories up on a narrow street of a large city. All day long, he sat in his high chair looking out the window. If he leaned forward, he could look just above the factory across the street and see some blue sky. Every once in a while, a white cloud would whiffed by, but most often it was dull gray. The street down below was much more interesting. There were people down there. In the early morning, men and women hurried to work. Later in the day, children came out and played in the pavement and on the gu in the gutters. Sometimes they danced and sang, but most often they were quarrelsome, <laughs> as kids can be. In the spring, the street organ man came, and then everybody seemed to be happy down there. But the little boy could only sadly look out all day long. It was only when he saw his mother coming that he smiled and waved his hand. Practiced. There you go. All right. One night he told his mother, I wish I could help you. You work so hard, and I can't do anything for you. Oh, but you do, she said. It helps me to see your face smiling down at me from the window. You make my work lighter all day to think you will be there waving to me when I get home. Then I'll wave harder, said the little fellow. The next day, a tired workman saw the mother looking up and waving as she arrived at home. So he looked up too. He saw that little pinched face in the high window. But how cheery was his smile. I'm just checking. Okay. The man laughed to himself and he waved his cap and the boy, a little shyly, returned the greeting. Participate. <laughs> there you go. All right. And so it was and so it went. The next evening the workman nudged his workmate to look up at the poor little chap sitting so patiently at the window, and the boy's smile shone out as two caps below waved in the air. Days came and passed, and the, the boy had more and more friends. Women came went and went out of their way to send a greeting to him. Life didn't seem quite so hard to them or to him when they saw his bright smile and thought what his life must be like. Sometimes a flower found its way to him or an orange or a colored picture. When the children saw that they were, he was watching them, they would stop their quarreling and play games to amuse him. It made them so happy to see how he enjoyed their good times. One night... One of the weary laborers told the mother, tell the lad we couldn't get on without him. It is a great thing to have a brave heart. It makes all of us brave too. Tell him that and you can be sure that she did. We've been looking at God calls. We started hearing how God calls us beloved and precious and with that reassurance we have moved into God calling Jesus to the mission as Messiah and Savior. But beyond that, we have also discovered that whether it was God calling the prophets of the Old Testament or Jesus calling the disciples in the New Testament, there is often involved in these calls an overwhelming sense of awe combined with a heightened awareness of our own limitations. This is followed by reassurances by action or word or both that we need not to fear but we can indu, indeed do what he is calling us to do if we only remember that he is with us, no matter how bleak the circumstances. We've heard the prophet Isaiah preach to a nation in crisis with an unhappy message about their future. Now we move forward in history and turn to the prophet Jeremiah, who is the prophet of record beginning about 30 years prior and up to the time when the nation encountered yet another consequence of their corruption and religious rebellion, falling to Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire. It was during the beginnings of this new wave of tumultuous times, times when the norm was that God's people were not following God's covenant expectations, that Jeremiah was born into a long family line of Jewish priests. And when the time came, he heard God's call. 
but he felt so intim- intimidated in those difficult days that he had some serious doubts about his ability to do what was certain to be an unpopular, poorly received ministry. But God came to him anyway. Read the yellow font while Ben and I lead on the white and the blue. The Lord's message came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I am your creator. Before you were born, I set you apart to speak for me. But Lord, I am not a good speaker, and I am too young. Do not say you are too young. You will go to whomever I send you and say what I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them, for I will be with you and protect you. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched Jeremiah's mouth and said, I am giving you the word to speak for me. Know for certain that I am sending you with my authority. Given a job. And for that to happen, it is important that God's breath, God's spirit, infiltrates every corner of our hearts and lives. So let's prepare our hearts for prayer by singing, Breathe on me, breath of God. Lord, you are our defender, our protection. We look to you for our every need, for you enable our very lives. Look favorably on we who gather in your name, for it is only your pleasure that matters. It is you who brings true honor by leading us to honorable living. And whatever our circumstances, we need never be afraid or ashamed of who we are. Instead, we put our hope in you, For you formed us and watched over us from day one. You are our strength and our fortress. This is why we crave your presence among us and with us and within us. As we rely on you, you rescue us from those things that weigh us down and deliver us to the freedom of new beginnings. We continue to pray for Ione Bennett, for Jim Malat, for the family and friends of Roy McGaha, and Jane Je- Jan Jepson and Rachel, all who passed away recently, and for those supporting Michelle Mathi and for her as she battles MS and cancer, and for Bill who is fighting with a coma and COVID and GBS. We also pray for the family of Larry Crook School, a friend of Bill Martin who died recently, and then Karen Nowak, her sister Rita, is back in the hospital with many health issues. We want to lift her up as well. And there are others who have been named previously or not named at all, but they're on our hearts and minds. And we just ask that you would undertake in all of these needs of the people here, watching at home, in our communities, wherever we may be. You know the needs. You know the joys. We just ask that you would be with us and through them all. For Lord, we are blessed 
For you bless all those who find their strength in you and whose life is a journey toward your heart, moving us from strength to strength until our trust finally finds us face to face with the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. This is this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One thing I hope that we are learning is that when we respond to God's call, our lives do not remain the same. So let's stand before the reading and sermon and sing a song you do not know, probably, but we will give it our best shot, the summons. Jesus had already already been successfully healing and teaching and becoming well-known in the region, region, including the fishing village of Capernaum when he came back to visit Nazareth, his hometown. We heard two weeks ago that he entered the synagogue and taught them that he was fulfilling Isaiah's words of an anointed king who would usher in an age of gracious salvation and peace for all people. The people among whom he grew up were duly impressed, but they also asked, isn't this Joseph's son? We heard that they had doubts about Jesus', Jesus claims about himself. Today, this inference and this confirmed as we pick up the story. Jesus has sensed or overheard their skepticism and responds to it. Jesus said to them, I know you will tell me the old saying, Doctor, heal yourself. 
you want to say. We heard about the thing you did in Capernaum. Um, do those same things here in your own uh, hometown. Then he said, the truth is, a prophet is not accepted in his own hometown. During the time of Elijah, it did not rain in Israel for three and a half years. There was no food anywhere in the whole country. There were many widows in Israel during that time. But the fact is, Elijah was sent to none of these widows in Israel. He was sent only to the widow in Sarpath of a town seat hit on. And there, there were many people with leprosy living in Israel during the time I am of the proper Elisha. But none of them were healed. There, the only one was not Amen. And he was from the country of Syria, not Israel. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were very angry. They got up and forced Jesus to go out of town. Their town was built on a hill. They took Jesus to the edge of the hill to throw him off. But he walked walked through the middle of the crowd, and went away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So Jesus' message in that day in his hometown sounded wonderful. On the other hand, the Nazarenes had watched him grow up, and they had their doubts that he could rise to that kind of greatness. Maybe that wasn't only their opinion of Jesus, but their self-image of their whole community. In Jesus' day, Nazarene was an actual synonym for the word despised. When Philip came to his brother Nathaniel and told him he had found the, mo found the one Moses and the prophets had written about and that it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nathaniel expressed the popular opinion of the place. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Jesus uses a typical teaching style. He puts to their face the arguments they thought and spoke behind his back. He puts into their mouths. You say, doctor, heal yourself. Or to put it in the more generic terms we often hear today, if God would only prove himself by doing such and such, then I will believe in him. Of course, usually the conditions of such proofs are that even if God complied, they would write it off as something else and not God. In their case, Jesus said, his childhood neighbors were saying, Jesus, you struggled against poverty and the difficult conditions and reputation of Nazareth just like the rest of us have. Now prove you've risen above all of that and therefore you can lift us from that as well. Prove it by doing the kind of miracles we heard that you did over in Capernaum. To be clear, there's nothing wrong with seeking God's compassionate help for healing or anything else, his gracious salvation, timely rescue and intervention, but concerns for needs was not their concern. They simply were seeking proof of power. God is not concerned about proving himself to anyone. He will not be coerced to submit to tests of his existence or power or love. He may choose to do so, but he won't be coerced to it. Jesus moves right on to another particular well-known saying describing why exceptional people are not recognized as such by those who know them best. He illustrates with two powerful Old Testament prophets who were also seen skeptically by those who lived with them in their day. For this reason, they were not sent to their own people, but to foreigners who would recognize their greatness. Jesus is warning the Nazarene synagogue members and maybe us that if we did not accept him as God's chosen Messiah, he too would be sent to outsiders. And before this little story that Jesus gave, Jesus' claim to be God's anointed only nagged the Nazarenes with doubts. The idea that God's grace and salvation could be diverted to other people to become God's people 
people they considered not religious and therefore even more despised than themselves, this enraged them to what they considered justifiable murder. Now Nazareth is tucked into a hollow up against three sides of the town, had mountain around it. So there are plenty of slopes in which to bring Jesus to throw him off and fulfill their hopes and throw him to his death. This bloodthirsty hate was shared by the synagogue leaders in Pisidian Antioch and in Jerusalem against Paul when he gave the same warning about their rejection of Christ, leading God's salvation to being offered to the Gentiles. But on this day in Nazareth, Jesus, perhaps miraculously, perhaps not, walks away from the crowd unscathed and went again to Capernaum to resume his ministry and call the fishermen to become his disciples, as we heard last week. Jesus had no doubt about who he was or that he was going to bring in God's salvation to the world. His challenge was overcoming the doubts of religious leaders a conflict from which he escaped death today, but doubts and disbelief would spread and grow no matter what he did to prove himself. And when Jesus knew the time was right, the people conspired with political leaders leading to his death and salvation for us. The prophet Jeremiah would face similar challenges He knew right up front that people would doubt him and the truth of his mission, that he was in service of a global creator, pronouncing God's word without compromise, even when it was uncomfortable and dangerous. He told King Zedekiah, for example, that he would be handed over, exiled to the Babylonian king, speaking God's determinations about the rise and fall of great threatening nations like Assyria and Babylon and Egypt and even smaller surrounding nations that were always attacking Israel violently. And if that wasn't enough, add to it the religious leaders and false prophets who had their doubts and stirred up doubts in the crowds about Jeremiah's message by offering an alternative message that sounded a lot better than what Jeremiah was warning them about. Just as the people stirred up public opinion to oppose Jesus and to oppose Paul later on. All this together... And more added up to an intimidating, formidable task for Jeremiah. And as we heard, it stirred up plenty of self-doubts within the young prophet. In fact, the opposition and pressures of his position would lead him into dark times in which he was at times overcome by despair. Most tradition holds that he wrote the book of Lamentations, lament, poetical poems about poetical poems, poems about grief and loss and pain and suffering. And though that had not yet happened, it is not surprising that Jeremiah hesitated. He could see that coming down the road. Hesitated, saying he lacked training and experience as a speaker and that he was too young. The good news is that Human inadequacy and inexperience give space for divine equipping. Paul argued that God's grace was sufficient and God's power and all the more obvious in those who are weak. Therefore, Paul boasts and delights in weaknesses and insults and persecutions and hardships and difficulties because when he is weak, then God is strong through him because Christ's power would be seen as it rested on him. Jeremiah needed a call so strong that it would reassure and sustain his faith in God and his God's mission during dark, difficult days. In the first half of my ministry, it seemed like every clergy gathering I attended we were asked to break into groups and tell each other call stories. There seemed to be an understanding that at some point in most of our ministries, we would probably need to have those call stories so deeply ingrained in us in the forefront and foundation of our memory if we were ever going to make it through ministry. And Jeremiah faced much worse than we ever experienced. 
This call, like many prophets, is a dialogue between Jeremiah and God. It is strikingly familiar with the call of Moses, which sends an underneath message underneath to all who heard the message, as well as to Jeremiah himself, that Jeremiah authentically stands in the succession of Moses, which puts him on solid ground as a valid spokesperson for God, an assurance that both he and those who believed him would need in the years that would follow. The first assurance is a direct word from God that came to him. The word of the Lord came to me. The word is not just words. For them, what a person thinks and plans and says and does are all part of word. So that whole experience, God came to him and his message came to him, his presence was felt, gave him confidence so that he'd be able to speak and act in declaring what the message was. The second assurance comes from knowing that God's purpose and destiny for Jeremiah was set before he was even born. Remembering this in dark, desperate days may not have made Jeremiah feel comfortable in those dark and desperate days, but it was something that he could hang on to and helped him from second-guessing that he was on the wrong track. Much like Jesus knew his destiny was to die for the world, it still gave him a sorrow that he'd rather not experience, as we know from the Garden of Gethsemane. But knowing it, that that was his destiny, also gave him the courage to boldly move forward toward it and face it anyway. The third assurance comes in the same sentence, and it is that we are known. I knew you. I know you. God says. And the word does not just mean intellectually, I know who you are, it means I know you in relationship. Deep, personal, unwavering, committed relationship. The fourth assurance is that God set Jeremiah apart for God's exclusive use. We often use the word consecrated, something dedicated only for sacred use. Thus, altar candles are never used for anything but altar candles. They're dedicated to that purpose alone. Jeremiah himself uses the phrase of the nation, translated as holy often. It's a holy nation. The nation is set apart for God, for God's purposes. And Jeremiah is an individual set apart for God's service as well. And closely related, the fifth assurance is that Jeremiah is appointed as a prophet to the nations. God authorizes Jeremiah to represent him, to be his voice to the world. Since God's sovereign scope is not limited, neither will be the prophet's declarations. They will be for everybody. The sixth assurance doesn't necessarily sound like an assurance so much, but it invalidates Jeremiah's reasons for not doing it. God says, Don't say you're too young. You must go and do what I say. Jeremiah belongs to God, so this wasn't just a, are there any volunteers out there? It was a summons, which is why we sang that song. Excuses are dismissed. That doesn't mean they aren't yet felt. The call description is an all-encompassing summons of call to full commitment, but it's also kind of vague and uncertain. He hasn't given him everything he's going to say for the next 30 years. It's going to be one of those, you know, as you go. And for the most part, for most of us, being called to a complete commitment to something we don't know what we're committing ourselves to is a scary thing. Therefore, the seventh assurance right on its heels is don't be afraid because with every order that I give, God says, I will be with you and protect you and rescue you. Just as he rescued the nation from Egypt, just as he rescued David from the bear and the lion, as the temple songs repeatedly sing about rescue in ways that went far deeper in the soul than just physical circumstances. And then the final assurance is expressed almost as a direct quote from Deuteronomy where the Lord reaches out and touches his mouth and says, I have put my words in your mouth. 
We just heard similar imagery in Isaiah. And it's also in the prophet Ezekiel. It's a powerful expression of God's commitment to be personally involved and connected with everything God asks him them to do. In Jesus, Jeremiah, and even in Paul, as well as many others, God's involvement covered the whole of their life, their family, their experiences, their training, those who influenced them, their grasp of cultural movements, all of their past, bad or good, shaped them and prepared them for God's service. Jesus' call, Jeremiah's call, these aren't our calls. We aren't called to be the Messiah. We aren't called, I don't think, to tell everybody what's going to happen with the nations in the next 70 years. Not even our own. May, not be, may or may not be calling us to full-time professional ministry, but he has called all of us to be Christian and to serve as an important part of his kingdom team. And he certainly calls us to be to our families, to our friends, and those we interact with on a regular basis. He calls us to treat them all with the love of Christ. Our call may not all be alike. We may not all have the same elements within them, the same assurances, the same purpose, and the same destiny, but we are all called in some way. And there are some consistent principles in how God calls and works through and with his people. He knows us and is committed to us, he knows what we are capable of in his equipping hands. He may use our past experiences, good and bad, to shape us and prepare us. He will direct us to our highest purpose in him. He will go ahead of us and prepare the way for us and be with us and involved in whatever and wherever and to whomever he sends us. Regardless of what results or lack of results he is creating through us. And to do all of this, as I said last week, all he needs from us is all of us. A willingness to die to sin, and to live the Christian ethic, and to reply, pro, reply positively to his call of this moment, of this hour, in this day, in this week, in this month. Each day we rise and answer the call again by asking, what, Lord, do I do today? And for who? This is, in essence, the communion covenant that Jesus establishes with us, that he is committed to us in love and direction, and we are committed to him in love and obedience. So all who are willing to say yes to him are invited to participate at the communion table. Let's prepare our hearts by singing just one verse of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, a prayer for God to nourish us with his power and abundant provision. So let's continue to prepare our hearts through a time of confession. Dear holy and awe-inspired Father, we come into your presence aware of our sins and failings. Though there is greatness in us and a deep longing for goodness, we too often deny our better selves and refuse to hear your voice calling calling us to rise to the full height of our humanity. At times we find ourselves walking in darkness with our vision obscured. We do not look within and we are unwilling to look beyond to those who need us. 
We are too weak to walk without your help. But with us, as a strong friend, we, and teaching us to walk of your truth, we ask that you would do this. For you are a merciful and gracious God, endlessly patient, loving and true, showing mercy to thousands, forgiving inequity, transgression and sin, and granting pardon on this promise. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. So we confidently say, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks for grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. From everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness, formed us in your image, and breathed into us the breath of life. When we fail, your love remains true. You deliver us and covenant to be our God and speak to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to be and preach the good news of salvation and peace with God through his suffering, death, and resurrection, delivering us from sin and death and made with us a new covenant in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup and at home as well. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. When the Lord ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of his word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. And he lifted it up and he gave thanks for it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he lifted it up and he gave thanks for it. And then he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is offered for the forgiveness of your sins and for the sins of many. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Lord, it is by our love that we are known to be your followers. It is by trusting that we become fully human. It is by changing that we hope to grow. What we were when we came will not be what we are when we leave. For we have met with each other in your presence at your table. We have heard you call our name and we will never be the same because we stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We can overcome doubts about you, doubts that others have about us, and our own doubts about ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's stand as comfortable, and let's sing as we close out. My is built on nothing. 
nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When this veils his lovely face, on his unchanging grace, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds with it veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. With oath his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood, when all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Now, as you go, may you be strengthened, comforted, and inspired to live lives worthy of God, who calls you to fulfill his purpose and your destiny, and covenants with you, and assures you that as you participate in his kingdom and in his family. Amen.